Happy New Year, everybody. Can you believe it? We've made it to 2022. Huh. And guess what that means? That means this is the January Q&A and we've got some more emails and some questions. And it never ceases to amaze me how interesting this beekeeping gig can get. And so if you have a question and you'd like to get them answered, don't forget somewhere at the bottom of this show, there's a link that you can email us some more questions and you might get into February's marches or who knows when. So we're going to start with Gary. Gary, Gary says, recently I acquired two beehives with bees and extra equipment. One of the hives is a standard wooden box and the other is a new plus plastic box. The wooden box is quite strong and the new plus hive is a, is a weaker colony and seems to be struggling. Even after manipulating some brood from the stronger hive, which kind of helped, and then we requeened, I was wondering if the new plus box, each time I have gone there, it always seems to have a lot of condensation, which gives me why they are not forging ahead. Well, there you go. Now, the interesting thing with the new plus boxes is that back, it depends what base it's got on it, because back in their original format, they had a solid base and a solid lid, and they, the bees found it a little bit hard to get organised. Hopefully, you've got some hive mats in both boxes, because that slows them getting in the lid and also protects them from the actual moisture that can condensate. But the best thing that I've found, I mean, the hives that I own that, the, that are plastic, they all have a vented base. And that seems to help as long as as long as the you know the jolly base isn't all covered in crap so it can get out. But that seems to work so that the moisture can sort of come out the bottom. And the girls can fan it out of the hive easier. I don't 100% know why plastic and wood, other than the fact that wood's a natural thing, and it will let it soak the moisture soak into the wood a little bit and then come back out. So it could be debated, and I'm not really going to get into the argument about what's best: foam, plastic, wood. Dolly got, I tell you what, because, well, as a matter of fact, we could have a whole side forum that could run for every beekeeper from here to Timbuktu would have an opinion. And sometimes it depends where you live in the country as to what's the best product to go for. But my first thought is have a look in the base. If it's not a vented base, go and buy one of them. Or hell, I guess you could take it to the workshop and drill holes in it. And John's written in and he says, does it matter too much if stickies don't go back in the original box? And how do you know where they should go? Well, ultimately, it doesn't matter to the bees. It's really just about you because you're talking about a barrier system. And the idea, I mean, because of the size we are, we kind of go with a apiary barrier system. So we just go with that 100 hives as that truckload and we try to put those frames back in the same box. Well, not back in the same box, but back in the same apiary at least. And the concept is, of course, if you're extracting honey and you mix them up and you haven't done your hive inspection or you've been very unlucky and you've got a jolly bit of foul brood or, or European brood disease or even chalk brood, some of those diseases can transfer on the stickies back into your healthy hives. So the concept is if you've only got a small amount and you can be diligent enough to actually mark the top of each frame and mark the box with a number so you know that those frames go back in those boxes, you will stop the transfer of diseases quite so much. So that's the general concept of a barrier system. I mean, it's rather interesting. The further, the bigger you get, the more complicated it gets. So I would suggest that you, if you can do it on a small scale, it's a good idea. But the bees don't care. It's really just about your ability to manage disease. That's the whole point of the exercise. I hope that answers your question. I have a sneaking suspicion this email from Bob. I reckon Bob's an engineer somehow, or he's at least least interested in how stuff works. He says, hey, Bush Bee Man, how on earth does the truck crane work? It makes no sense how you can roll back and forth and have the winch at the back end. Is there some fancy cabling going on? Might. Now, if you, if you go back to episode 150, you can see where the fancy cabling came into being because some bloke went and got an old truck from an old beekeeper and... I don't know, some fool thought he was going to drive it home. But anyway, we got it home. So that crane must be, heck, I don't know, that's from the jolly 70s. And the thing about it is, is that back then they didn't even have car winches. So what it is, is the back at the, at the back that you can see, it's not actually a winch, it's actually a motor. It's been converted, well, it's actually got, make it a 24 volt, make an old motor work, and it's just got a gearbox on the side of it. And so the cable winds in and winds out when the, whether the gearbox is going forward or back. And then it just loops around, loops around the end where the cradle is. 
And so that lets it go up and down, and then for us rolling backwards and forwards is only just on a just on a beam, I guess it is, and it can roll back and forward on the track. So yes, there is some fancy cabling, but to be absolutely honest, I look at it and I go, that was pretty jolly clever, and I probably wouldn't have been able to work it out myself, but I worked it out enough to change the cable, fix it up. I spent, I don't know, I think I spent $4,000 on the jolly solenoids and crap to make the thing work, which was kind of crazy. So I don't know. If you can afford an easy loader, perhaps that's the way to go, but I haven't got 50 grand laying around that I could get rid of, so. But hell, you never know. If the easy loader people are watching this show and they want to put a promo out, you never know, I could hang one of them on me truck. <laughs> Simon says, hey mate, I have a flow hive in somewhat of a small yard and I'm just about, every day the bees seem to give me a tap. And then they're trying to sting him, I would think. And the other day he tagged my poodle. Ah, oh, my daughter's got a poodle, poor lad. And it was hit twice as well, and what's your opinion? Oh, golly, bees in the yard. One option is, where is the water source that, they're, that the bees are getting water from? And are they flying? Because you know, like, quite often bees are a little bit, they'll go in a certain direction to the, they'll, yeah, they like, they're women folks, so they don't like wasting time. They'll just go in a direct line to wherever they're headed. So if they're heading towards you know, I don't know, a water source or a food source and it happens to be a thoroughfare that you're walking through, that can get them psycho. The other thing is, are they flying in with their bum facing you and trying to sting you on the way in? Because that happens sometimes when they're in a bad mood and they'll come in, poof. And if, they, if they're an angry beehive, it's probably not a bad option to think about going and getting a new queen. Like you can get them online, you can get like a little queen in a cage. The fun part about that job, of course, is finding the queen to replace her. That's a whole nother episode, but I think if you go to basic and beekeeping soon enough, you'll be able to see how to do that. But let's not get too carried away. So it depends on whether you're, if you look, are you talk, walking through the traffic or are they actually just targeting you and going bang? And then that can mean that they're aggressive and they need to get requeened so they can just chill out a little bit. And the size of your yard really shouldn't matter that much because as long as, yeah, they can fly over the fence, obviously, to the neighbours and get some food from them. <laughs> that's just why God gave them wings. So that girl 711 is written in. Obviously, that's her YouTube name, which is kind of cool. I might sneal that. Who knew? Anyway, I wonder if she works at the 711. Do they still have 711s? You know, the deli that are never shut. Now, the supermarket's never shut here in Loxton, which is kind of crazy. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> She writes in and says, I'm in Wyala, so no supplies near me. <laughs> no wonder. What's the best bee suit to get for a new starter? Loving everything you're doing. And on my 60th birthday, I'm getting my own hive. I don't know, does that make me an older or a younger beekeeper? Well, there you go. It's all relative. I mean, age is all relative anyway, isn't it? Oh, heck, you could always say you're new, you're a young beekeeper. So then, you know, that's just a play on words. So it's all good if you're new at it. That would make you a young beekeeper, wouldn't it? I think so. And I'll bet you've been online and you've had a look at all the stuff that you can buy and you've got yourself horribly confused because they're everywhere from about a $20 bee suit to about a $500 bee suit. And it's, oh, yes, it is kind of hectic. My advice would be you get yourself a vented suit, which is three layered. I mean, I've got a few different ones. Aussie Armour does a really good job. They actually make a really reasonable bee suit for what it is. Mind you, it's called Aussie Armour, but I'm really sure it's not made in Oz, but anyway, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of other brands out there. I think I've got a, I've got a BB suit that I imported from England because the guy wanted to, you know, get a shout out on the show. And that's really cool, except it's a bit out of, <laughs> it's a little bit expensive for what they are, but they're, you know, I haven't been stung in the thing, which is a thing, but... I would suggest you don't just use a thin canvas bee suit because the wife's got one of them because you want it to be pink and then she has to wear a shirt underneath it so she can't get stung. And of course on a hot day, well, that's fun. So that's my two cents worth. But you know what? The good thing about beekeeping is if you've got a beehive, don't forget to order a smoker and a hive tool while you're ordering that to save on postage. The thing will be, it won't be long and you'll be like me. I got a, I got a bloody suitcase in my shed that's full of bee, bee suits that... I think I'm waiting until I have a, I don't know, a, a bee wrangler day and we'll have all these different bee suits pop out of the suitcase and who knows, what are we wearing? Well, there you go. We've come to the end of the questions that we could actually print up from this episode. I hope you're enjoying yourself. 
we're planning bigger and brighter and bigger things for 2022. Tell you what, we gotta catch our feet, catch our breath, and then here we go. So if you're enjoying the show and you feel like you wanna actually support us and see what crazy crap we can come up with next year, or actually crazy crap we can come up with this year, because here we are in 2022, and we've got plans, and we're actually, hell, we might even write up a bit of a system so we have some idea of what we're going to film week to week. The young fella's lovely daughter's getting a little bit older now, and life's starting to get sorted out. I'm starting to get a little bit rational, but hell, not too rational, otherwise the show wouldn't work. So, But if you want to if you want to see where we can go, tittle on down here to the Patreon supporty thingy jig, Give that a click. I don't know, send us $500 a month and hell, you never know where we'll go.